and welcome back to another episode of What the Forensics. My name is Rebecca, and today I'm joined here again by the lovely Journey and Nicole. This week, we're going to be doing things a bit differently. Uh, instead of a forensic uh, topic and a case study, each one of us is going to discuss uh, our own case that we chose um, that is based out of Nova Scotia. So today, Journey's going to be telling us all about these Sydney River McDonald's murders. Nicole will be educating us on the Goler clan of uh, South Mountain, and I will be telling us about the Butterbox Babies. I would also like to note before we begin that there is a listener's discretion advised because we do have detailed descriptions of sexual assault that is involving children, as well as incest, abuse, infant deaths, as well as homicide. So with this being said, let's get into the episode. So I'm going to be starting us off with the case study of the Butterbox Babies. I first heard about this case uh, in late middle school, and I didn't know a lot about it up until doing research for this but i had always been interested in it just because it's a it's a pretty tragic history um and it just kind of shows the side of uh, maternity homes that we don't often hear about um so this case of the butterbox babies begins with the married couple uh, william peach and lila gladys young william was born in 1898 and he graduated from the medical evangelists college in new brunswick in 1923 becoming an unordained minister for the seventh day adventist church lila was born in 1899 in nova scotia and she lived with her family until she met uh william in 1925 when she (laughs) sorry when she shortly got married to him uh that same year so they had known each other for less than a year when they got married um Shortly after getting married, William and Lila moved to Chicago together, uh, where they both promptly went to school. Uh, So in 1927, William graduated from the National College of Chiropractic as a chiropractor, and Lila graduated from the National School of Obstetrics and Midwifery as a midwife. So uh, pretty soon after they graduated in 1927, Uh, They moved back to Nova Scotia, so this was in February of 1928, and it was when they returned that they opened uh, the Life and Health Sanitarium in Chester, Nova Scotia. At the time of their opening, their clinic's motto was, where the sick get well. However, after just a year of business and Lila delivering multiple babies at their clinic, uh, they ended up becoming known for their maternity services. Um, So it's around this time that they renamed and rebranded their business. They then called it the Ideal Maternity Home, or IMH for short. Um, And it's from this point on that their primary service was maternity care and was also known as a place that unwedded women could go and receive maternity care uh, without judgment or go uh, more surreptitiously. Because as we know, in that time, unwed women who were pregnant weren't seen very highly, unfortunately. So... Uh, to start with a couple problems of this maternity home, um, the practice wasn't licensed. However, this being 1928, licensing laws for maternity houses were very vague, so it wasn't really enough to raise concern for their business. Um, another problem was that Lily advertised herself as an obstetrician and called herself a doctor on, uh, company letterhead however she only had midwife qualifications so she wasn't actually a doctor and this was very misleading to patients who thought they were getting care from a doctor um is the midwife house just like another word for orphanage or is it kind of different uh so the midwife house is where women would go to um They could go to this house if they're in labor and they would basically, the midwife would help them deliver the baby. And then for a couple weeks, they were offered a bed at the midwife house and there was like a nursery there. So other people could take care of uh, not only her child while the mother is trying to rest up, uh, but also take care of the mom if she had any health problems after the birth. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So um, for the maternity care services, um, sources vary with how much they charged. Um, However, the sources did say that they charged unwed women significantly more for care than married women. Um, It was said that unwed women were often charged around $500 for their services. Um, So they had to pay in advance about $100 to $200 for a bed. 
uh, delivery aid and adoption arrangements if they didn't want to keep the child. Um, in addition, they were told to pay $12 per diaper oh. and at least $2 a week as a maintenance fee for um, the house. Um, and in addition, if the child had died while in the care uh, at this house, mothers were made to pay a $20 funeral fee. Oh, that's really rude. Yeah, um, and to make matters worse, uh, just for reference, the average wage in Chester, Nova Scotia at this time was only between 4 and $8 a week. Oh. So many of the women who came to this house for care couldn't actually afford the care that they were given, uh, so subsequently they were made to work at the IMH until their debt had been repaid, some women working there for upwards of 18 months. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so uh, this was kind of a way for the Youngs to uh, get free labor out of their clients, which is very unfortunate. Um, but their outrageous prices for this subcar subpar care was not even where the problems ended with the home, unfortunately. So at the time of the home's operation, uh, cross-religion adoptions were illegal in the USA. So basically all this means was that a Catholic family was only allowed to adopt a Catholic-born child, a Jewish family was only allowed to adopt a Jewish-born child, and etc. Um, and in addition to this um, law, there were many Jewish families in the U.S. looking to adopt children at this time. However, there was also a shortage of Jewish-born children being adopted out. And because the Youngs knew this, uh, being from the States, they took advantage of the new mothers giving birth, as well as prospective parents wanting children and innocent children. Um, so seeing this as a money-making opportunity, the Youngs began illegally selling babies to prospective families in the U.S. and Canada. Most of the children uh, were that were adopted to the U.S. went to families from New York and New Jersey, and many of the Canadian... Uh, families that adopted children had remained in Atlantic Canada. Um, did the families buying the babies know that this was illegal or did they think it was like an actual adoption? So a lot of sources uh, say that most of the families didn't actually know that this operation was as shady and illegal as it was. They were coming th to them because they were just, they've wanted a child, but for whatever reason, couldn't have their own and they were out of options in the u.s so they saw this as a good opportunity and they didn't actually know of any of the crimes that the youngs were committing so they did think that they were getting them lawfully and actually it said that a lot of the surviving children of uh the home went to quite good families it's just unfortunate how it how it happened that they ended up getting adopted so were the were the youngs also claiming that these infants were of a religion that they weren't to make sure that they were going to like a Jewish family and so they'd say well this child was born Jewish so yeah you can adopt him kind of thing I'm to be completely honest I'm not sure that fact didn't actually come up in my research which confused me a little bit um but I would take it to believe that either they led the families to believe that they were of the religion they thought or the families were willing to accept that they weren't the same religion and try to pass it off as the same when returning to the States. Okay. Yeah, so um, not only were the Youngs illegally, uh, not even just adopting out the children, but ad illegally selling the babies for adoption, um, but they were known to have charged anywhere from 1000 to $10,000 for infants. And that's in that's in their time's currency, so that's not... That's not inflated for today. Holy smokes. Yeah, and unfortunately, the story only continues to get worse. And it's... This whole thing is very sad to research, but it is quite interesting to know that there's such a dark history that a lot of people are unaware of. Um, so these infants that were sold, um, they weren't only children that knew mothers wish to give up for adoption so they weren't babies only coming from unwed mothers who wished to give up their children um, but they were also taking babies from mothers who wanted to keep them uh, so they did this often by helping the mother give birth and then telling the mother um, that their child either 
was born stillborn or very soon after as they were uh, helping the child and getting it ready to see the mother had actually died before the mother got a chance to see it. Uh, But instead, they would actually just bring it into one of the nurseries where they would uh, prepare it for adoption. Oh, my goodness. And in addition to this, they would frequently separate siblings if there was a prospective family that only wanted one child, or they would pair unrelated children and tell prospective uh, families that they were siblings for the families who wanted to adopt twins or siblings. So there was a lot of familiar separation here, uh, which is probably very traumatic once the infants grow up and realize they have an unknown sibling or they're not even related to their sibling. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so even though, as I said earlier, many of the babies that were adopted did go to loving families, um, not all of them, unfortunately, had the same fate. Many of the children that were born at uh, the ideal maternity home never made it out, unfortunately. Um, The Youngs pretty much saw this as a strictly money-making business, so they didn't want to take care of children that they deemed, quote, unadoptable or unmarketable. Um, unquote. And as such, they would actually end the lives of the children they gave that title. Um, The children that they deemed unmarketable or unadoptable were any with a disability, an illness, or, quote, a dark complexion, unquote. So children that weren't white, essentially, they thought were unadoptable. Wow. Uh, They murdered these infants by either refusing to give them the care they required to stay alive and healthy if they were ill, um, or if the child was otherwise healthy, uh, they would feed them nothing but a diet of molasses and water until they ultimately starved to death because of malnutrition. And this often took around two weeks of the child just starving on nothing but this terrible diet. That's horrible. Couldn't they have had at least a little shred of decency out of everything that they've done to, like, quickly take this child's life, if that's the case? Like, what's the point of making them suffer for two weeks? I know. I felt the same way. I was like, I don't agree with any of it at all. But if it's going to happen, why did they have to prolong it so much? Yeah. Yeah. So, after the infants had passed... Uh, the Youngs would place them in a small wooden box that they often painted white to more resemble a coffin. Um, But the box they placed them in was actually often used to carry groceries in this day. They often called them butter boxes because many held their dairy products in them. Um, And the Youngs would either bury or, sorry, have employees of their property bury the children on their land in unmarked graves uh, adjacent to a cemetery that was in another plot of land. Or they would burn them in their furnace or alternatively throw them into the ocean where they didn't think they'd be found. Oh my goodness. Uh, So between the years of 1928 and 1935, Lila reported, I suppose to the government or whoever you report birds to, uh, that 148 uh, children had been born at their facility and 12 infants had died at the home. Even just this mortality rate Um, at their home was nearly triple that of the rest of Nova Scotia's. Uh, Nova Scotia's infant mortality rate was 3.1%, but this equated to 8.1% mortality rate. Wow. So um, the youngs had started to come into suspicion from like the public or uh, enforcement on March 4th of 1946, Uh, when they were charged with two counts of manslaughter of a mother and an infant who had died while in their care. Uh, The mother's name was Eva Neeforth, and it was her newborn child who died as well. Their death was allegedly caused by negligence in unsanitary conditions at the home. However, um, after um, after their trial in May of 1936, which only lasted three days, Uh, Both William and Lily were acquitted of all of these charges because of a lack of evidence of uh, the the death caused by negligence. Oh. So, despite their acquittal, the RCMP was still relatively suspicious of them, so they adopted a policy to investigate every reported death at the home in the years that followed. I don't exactly know why they weren't doing that before, but I guess it was the 1920s in the Great Depression, and there was a lot of children dying anyways so i guess they just didn't have the resources to always investigate them but they made it they made sure they would investigate every 
death at the home after this point. Um, the RCMP's problem with investigating every reported death at this home was that there was a significant, uh, significantly underreported deaths at the home. So they weren't reporting as many infant deaths as the RCMP believed there were. Um, and also after this trial, the public health officials continued to look for evidence of negligence at the home, but they also failed to find any evidence of it until almost 10 years later in 1945. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so the first concrete evidence that the uh, health officials had actually gotten in neglect came in 1945 after an inspector had visited the home and they reported squalid conditions uh, as well as swarming flies and they said filthy bedding and as well as some of the infants in their care were weighing just 50% of their normal weight for their age. Oh my goodness. Oh my yeah, so I suspect that these children that weighed significantly less were probably in the midst of being starved, unfortunately. Um, but it, that no report specified that that's what was happening to those specific children. Um, but with this evidence um, of the gross conditions, as well as the Maternity Boarding House Act of 1940 tightening licensing requirements for such businesses, uh, the Youngs were actually denied a license for their maternity home and were forced to shut it down in November of 1945. So this seemed like a win. However, because they appealed the case, they were allowed to continue operating without a license until the appeal was looked over and either confirmed or denied. Um, but at this point, they had many more than just the health officials and RCMP after them seeking justice. So at one point, uh, the U.S. Immigration Services also got involved because they were starting to hear reports of, um, babies illegally being sold to American families. Um, and in March of 1945, the Youngs were acquitted of eight counts, including a violation of maternity boarding house act as well as practicing medicine without a license um but they were charged with just three of the eight counts and even though they were charged with three they only actually got a 150 fifty dollar fine for their crimes that's all um yeah and that's especially gross considering that they were literally millionaires because of how many babies they had sold and how many women they had helped give birth so yeah, no jail time, disgusting. no anything, just $150, you're free to go. Yep. Uh, free to go until just over a year later, uh, when the Youngs were once again put on trial, this time because they were charged and then convicted of illegally selling babies to four American couples. So they did find enough evidence to charge and convict them with that. However, this charge, which seems even worse than the first got them just a fine of $428.90. Disgusting. <laughs> wow. So, following this, um, it was later that same year that William actually got convicted of perjury during the June trial. Um, it was said that during all of this, William became a very heavy alcoholic. Um, so, we're unsure if the perjury was due to a shoddy memory because of the alcoholism or if he was genuinely trying to hide facts. Um, but despite him being convicted of this perjury, it still didn't stop Lila from continuing to illegally run this home. Uh, and she still helped women deliver babies at the home in 1947, two years after they should have been shut down. Oh, so at the very end of 1947, the home was finally shut down after Lila got really, really sick of the media's coverage of their trial, um, and she filed a $25,000 uh, LaBelle lawsuit against the media coverage, but she promptly lost it after a very short trial, and it caused the couple to go bankrupt and have to permanently shut down the home. William Young uh, then died of cancer a few years later in Christmas of 1962, and Lila died of leukemia in 1967. During the home's operation, the Youngs were caring for up to uh, 70 children at any one time. Wow. Uh, the initial four-bedroom cottage that they began the home in ended up being transformed into a 54-bedroom home with 14 bathrooms and multiple nurseries. Oh my goodness. And in the end, it is believed that 
that the Youngs were directly responsible for the deaths of between four and six hundred uh, babies. Wow. Wow, not, yeah. Not all of the bodies have been found. As we had said, many had been uh, cremated, but then also many had been thrown at sea where fishermen were finding them. Uh, and even more were buried on their property. Wow. Um, and even though it's terribly tragic and so many lives were lost we do still have survivors of the ideal maternity home today uh, those that were adopted out to families and now there are survivors spread across the u.s canada and europe and in addition uh, there are numerous books movies and documentaries that document everything that happened to the butterbox babies as well as uh, talking to the survivors and basically um I believe there is still more information coming out about them as more people learn that they are survivors of this and learn that they were victims of the ideal maternity home. Um, and the building that had once held the ideal maternity home actually burned to the ground just a couple of years uh, after they shut down. Um, so as opposed to the home being there, it's now a memorial for all of the lives lost. Wow. And that's in, is that in Chester still? Yeah, it's still in uh, Eastern Chester, or sorry, East Chester, Nova Scotia. Interesting. I hope it yeah, was arson. So, Honestly, I hope someone set it on fire. It doesn't. I do too. <laughs> they um uh, before it burned down, they actually not the Youngs, but there were plans to turn the home into a resort. What? Oh. Which is gross. I don't know if they were just planning on hiding everything that happened there, but I wouldn't want to stay at a resort where something like this happened. Me That's neither. Disgusting. <laughs> yeah. What? How many people so, did that go through? They were like, yeah, this sounds like a really good idea. And then there's one sensible person that was like, how about we don't do this? And how about we just burn it to the ground? <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't normally condone arson, but in this case, I condone arson and I hope that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, with our first story um, unraveled and sadly explained, um, Journey, you're up next. Would you like to tell us about the Sydney River McDonald's murders? Yes, thank you. Uh, So, like Rebecca said, my case study is the Sydney River McDonald's murders, and it also happened in Nova Scotia. Um, So, jumping right in. Just after midnight on May 7th, 1992, three employees of the Sydney River McDonald's were performing their closing duties and another uh, employee was on his way to start his overnight shift. And for those who might not know, Sydney River is just a community south of Sydney on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. Um, So Donna Warren, who is 22... She was the manager on shift at this McDonald's and she was just like in the office counting out the money from the day and like putting it in the safe. And Neil Burrows, who was 29, he was cleaning the kitchen. Arlene McNeil, who was 20, had finished her shift and was waiting for Donna to leave. So they left together. Um, And then Jimmy Fagan, who is 27, He was the person who hadn't arrived yet and was on his way to kind of prepare the restaurant for opening the next day, and none of them were prepared for what was about to happen. So Derek Wood, who was 18, Darren Muse, who was 18 as well, and Freeman McNeil, who was actually not related to Arlene McNeil, um, was 23. They had hung out all winter and worked out a plan to rob the local McDonald's. And so Wood had started working there in March of 1992, and this happened in May. And then that's when he got this terrible idea. And they had actually expected to get away with up to $200,000 of money from the safe, uh, which is quite a bit. And in preparation for the robbery, Wood had left the back basement door open uh, with, like, his backpack, I think it was. And then he left his shift earlier. Um, And just so you know, like, the crimes technically took place on May 7th, but because they happened just after midnight, it would have felt like May 6th to the people who, like, were experiencing this. Um, And so while Muse and McNeil were waiting for Wood to finish up work and kind of get things ready, 
they layered up clothes so that they could strip off a layer after they completed their robbery, which is kind of smart because then they would no longer fit the description, like, clothes-wise. Um, and then their plan was to enter through the door in the basement that Wood had left open, and then once they were inside, McNeil would stand at the door and prevent people from leaving. Muse would guard the kitchen, and then Wood would rob the safe. And if anyone caused any trouble or tried to escape, their plan was to beat them unconscious. And so their plan was actually relatively non-violent. But on the night, Muse, Wood, and McNeil all met up once Wood had finished his shift, and they drove to a nearby dirt road where they parked their car and then walked the rest of the way to the McDonald's. And then shortly after midnight, they entered through the basement door and worked their way into the restaurant. Um, Wood took out the stolen 22 caliber pistol that he got from McNeil. Muse put on a rubber Halloween mask and had two knives. And then McNeil had a shovel handle. I'm not sure why he just had the handle and not the <laughs> whole shovel. Uh, but whatever. And he also had some ropes uh, to tie people up. And so they surprised Donna Warren and Arlene McNeil, both of whom recognized Wood as he was not disguised, and they saw him only a couple hours earlier. And just to keep it simple, since Arlene and Freeman have the same last name, I'm going to refer to the victims by their first names and then the attackers by their last names. Um, and one of my sources mentioned that Donna was prepared to give any robbers what they wanted, but was very confused to see her own employee as the robber. And when I started working at the grocery store, like, a long time ago, they told me just to give robbers what they wanted and to not be a hero. So I imagine that she received similar training, and that's why she was prepared to just give them what they wanted. And then... Um, oh, sorry? I was gonna say, unfortunately, that's the thing with, like, any store. Like, you physically cannot do anything except call yeah. the cops. Yeah, they're like, here's the, like, emergency button press it discreetly but give them what they want and I was like ah okay yeah my friend works at Brutes and she said three women came in grabbed a handful of clothes and they just walked out and yeah. like they couldn't do anything about it but call the cops but at that point like sure they gave a description but that's really all they could do yeah because you're not even allowed to chase shoplifters because it's a liability to you isn't it yeah 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 it could come back on the company which is so dumb, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, anyway, not following their relatively nonviolent plan, Wood shot Arlene in the head, like, right off the bat. Oh. Um, she did, Yeah, what? just walked in and shot her. Uh, she didn't die, but she was severely injured. Uh, McNeil told Wood to hurry up, and then they all ran upstairs. They surprised Neil Burroughs because he was working upstairs cleaning the sinks. Although it's very weird that he didn't hear the gunshot, because I can't imagine that it was quiet. But that's beside the point. Um, Wood then shot Neil in the head. Muse stabbed him in the neck, and then McNeil beat him with the shovel handle. He was then shot a second time in the head, which is what killed him. And I'm not too sure why they attacked him so viciously. It's odd that they went... From a relatively non-violent plan to like, oh, we're just going to take some money and kind of beat people unconscious if it comes down to it. Yeah. And then as soon as they get there, boom, two people dead right away. Yeah, right? I don't understand why they kind of escalated it so fast. Hmm. So after they killed Neil Burroughs... Uh, Wood went back downstairs to get Donna and bring her upstairs to unlock the safe, which she did. And then once the safe was unlocked and opened, Wood shot her in the head, killing her. And then he took the money out of the safe and it only equaled $2,000 and $2,017, which is quite a bit less than the 200000 that they were planning on getting. Just a bit. Yeah. Just and a little then, bit, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at 1 a.m., Jimmy Fagan arrived in a taxi for his overnight shift, and then he came into the restaurant through a different back door. Um, he saw Wood, who he recognized, and then he was shot by McNeil, but didn't die until the next day in the hospital. 
Uh, the three boys, Wood, McNeil, and Muse, jumped over his body and fled the restaurant. The taxi driver had heard what he described as a snap like a firecracker coming from the building. And then when he looked back, he saw two people running from the building. And he only saw two because Wood had gone back to get the backpack that he used to prop the basement door open with. And so then the taxi driver turned his car around and went back to the McDonald's to check things out. And he found Jimmy's body. And then he radioed his dispatcher for help at around 1.07 a.m. And then, like, police and everybody came. So to recap a little bit, the plan was to sneak in, steal $200,000 from the safe, and only beat up people if they tried to stop them or showed any kind of resistance. Instead, two people are severely injured, two people are dead, the only person who could be recognized wasn't disguised, they killed before anyone had a chance to react, and only made off with $2,000. So, they were not very good at keeping to their plan. This, no, not at all. This plan, like, <laughs> if you hadn't told us the age of these guys, this plan just screams 18-year-old Kate Breton boys. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> two 18-year-olds so, and a 23-year-old. Like, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah, their points for layering up got taken off real quick. Um, so then Wood, McNeil, and Muse were arrested by RCMP within 10 days of the murders, And I actually tell you how they get caught, and it's kind of hilarious. Um, So after months of preliminary hearings and arguments um, over where the trial will be held, court dates and locations were finally decided. And then one year after the original crime, they were preparing for their individual trials. So Derek Wood was tried from April 21st to June 2nd, 1993. And he was found guilty of attempted murder of Arlene McNeil, the first-degree murders of Donna Warren and Neil Burroughs, in addition to robbery and unlawful confinement. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. And he had additional sentences, but he's serving them concurrently, and so his longest was life without parole for 25 years. And then Darren Muse was tried second, and he pled guilty to second-degree murder of Neil Burroughs and to robbery on June 3rd 1992 so that's when his trial took place or 1993 sorry and then his other charges were dismissed due to the plea bargain and so he was sentenced to life in prison without parole for 20 years and then Freeman McNeil was convicted of first degree murder of Neil Burroughs second degree murder of Jimmy Fagan unlawful confinement and armed robbery on October 8th 1993 and he was given life in prison without parole for 25 years like Derek Wood. And so Derek Wood actually is still in prison, but he's applied for parole in 2015 and was denied. Um, Darren Muse was granted full parole in 2012 and was released from prison, but prohibited from returning to Sydney or any other surrounding communities. So following his release, uh, he moved to Quebec But then in 2015, he moved to Lower Mainland British Columbia with his common-law spouse to help look after her father. And luckily for him, his spouse and her father are actually quite well off, so he doesn't need to work, which I think is something that not every previously convicted individual has access to, which I think is kind of helping him, like, reintegrate into society and giving him a better life than if he had to find a job with a record of murder. So I found that kind of interesting. And then... Freeman McNeil is still in prison, but in 2017, he was granted temporary escorted absences, and as of November 5th, 2019, he has been allowed one temporary unescorted absence from prison once a month to allow for personal development and to assist with his reintegration into society. I don't know if that's still a thing. Um, There was nothing current about it after that one article. Um, so I'm not too sure, but I just wanted to clarify that temporary means that the absence only lasts between eight to 12 hours. So it's not like he's out for like a week at a time. Um, and then one thing that I found super interesting was that McNeil said that he didn't know that Wood was carrying a gun, but the gun belonged to his girlfriend's stepfather. So it's pretty hard to believe that he didn't know that he had a gun and a judge even said that McNeil saw Wood load the gun. So I, it's rather unlikely that he didn't know about it. 
And none of the three boys actually explained their actions or why they did it or why they escalated it so quickly, which I find very intriguing and I'd really like to know. And Arlene McNeil was the only person who survived the attack, but she was left severely disabled and then passed away in 2018 at the age of 46. Um, and then I have some fun facts about the case. Uh, so the McDonald's opened a week after this murder happened and it operated for eight years before it was closed down and then torn down and then they just built it in a different spot. I guess they just weren't getting good business after word got out that there was um, multiple murders there, a mass murder. Yeah, it only took them like a couple months to like business as usual kind of deal, which I thought was very interesting. And so, okay, how they got caught. So Derek Wood called the police on May 7th between 121 and 123 a.m., to say that he was standing outside the McDonald's having a smoke when he heard a bang, and then later that night, he went up to another police officer and told him the same thing, and that's how they got him into police custody. So he he thought, oh, you know what would be really smart? If I told on us and just said I was a witness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. So, did they, so take like, him, did they take him into questioning, and that's how they got him in custody? Uh, yeah, so they were like, okay, we're going to take your statement or whatever. Please come with us to the police station. He got in voluntarily, told them a whole story. And then one of the corporals who was actually, like, interviewing him thought there were some inconsistencies with his stories. Like, he couldn't remember which path he had taken from the McDonald's to the gas station to call the police or whatever. Um, so they arrested him on May 7th at 1.10 p.m., a little over 12 hours after the crime had happened. And then um, he also said that he didn't want any of the money. Oh. So why did he do it? Just bros being bros. You got to help your buddies out. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I think your plan no was to... <laughs> yeah. You robbed McDonald's for the money, but you don't want any? Okay. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um. And then McNeil's trial was the only one that was actually granted a change of venue, even though all three of them applied for one. But because he was tried last, the judge decided that there was so much media attention and information that he didn't think he could get a fair trial, so they moved it to Halifax instead of Sydney. And then lastly, on May 15th, 1992, a person by the name of Gregory Lawrence came forward and said that he was approached by Wood, Muse, and McNeil and asked if he wanted to participate in a robbery and get paid $20,000 because at that time they estimated that there would be $80,000 in the safe, which is still quite a bit less than the $200,000. Um, he obviously didn't take them up on that offer, but the boys still continued planning the robbery around him. Like, he even saw the gun and the mask used and McNeil even told him that he got the gun from his girlfriend's stepfather. These guys are very smart. Yeah. So they'd, like, really. meet outside of the McDonald's where he's working and, like, plan to rob it. But also, why would a McDonald's carry $200,000 in a safe? See, yeah. that's what I was wondering. Why, why are they keeping so much money on site? I don't yeah, think they purposely like any, don't do that. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think any retail business will do that or food industry business. Exactly. And I feel like money. Yeah, and I feel like if you work there, you'll know when they take the money to the bank, so you should hit it the day before. You have to do it well, at least when I worked at Levi's, you have to do a nightly deposit anyways. You only have yeah. like however much in your till. And then yeah. the rest goes to the bank. So would they not do something similar at McDonald's? I feel like you would have to. I feel like they till. should. But, like, if they did a nightly deposit, usually it's a $200 float. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just so dumb. I was like, where did you get $200,000 from? And $80,000 when you only got 2000 Like, oh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's all I have about the Sydney River McDonald's murders. Uh, it was not what I thought it was going to be. I don't know what I thought it was going to be, but I uh, 
Yeah, I just shook my head when I was researching. I was like, these guys. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they definitely don't sound like the brightest criminals there ever was. No. I mean, who plans a robbery right in front of the building you're going to rob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was either there or at a Tim Hortons. I can't remember what it said. But, but still, either way, you don't plan a crime in public. You don't. <laughs> and with people who aren't involved. Yeah. Did so they just weird. want, like, friends? Was he like, hey, can you just, like, spend time with us? Like, it no does, like we're going to plan a whole robbery and murder, but just hang out with us. They probably didn't think it was real. He's probably like, oh, yeah, they're going to rob the McDonald's. Mm, yeah. I feel like I that would know. just be, like, a common Sydney Cape Breton thing. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's another, <laughs> another Friday night in Cape Breton. <laughs> yeah, actually. Well, Journey, thank you so much for uh, telling us about that. I had always heard, like, the title of the Sydney River McDonald's murders, but I didn't know anything about it, so I really enjoyed hearing about it. Yeah, I'm glad I could share. (laughs) So, next up, uh, Nicole, would you like to uh, educate us on the Goler clan and who they were and what they did? I would love to. Um, Before I begin, though, I just want to start off with saying that you know, like, researching into this, we do realize that there's been a huge impact on, popula- like, those in the valley in Nova Scotia and the children involved, because there are still some children alive and generations that are still alive from this. So we aren't sharing this to kind of bring up the past and to cause harm to these family members, but we just want to learn from these events that happened, and we just want to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself, because it was quite horrific. And um, I had never heard of this case. Like, even though I grew up in Ontario, I never knew who the Goler family was. Um, So I do think it's an important piece of Nova Scotia history that should kind of be taught. But on that note, the Golers were a family of Nova Scotians that lived in the Annapolis Valley on what's called the South Mountain for generations. So they dated back to the 1800s. And there was little to no contact or connection with the world beyond their community. So they first settled back in kind of the 19th century. At that time, it could take them up to three days to get to Halifax. So from Kentville, which is where South Mountain is, to Halifax. And that's a trip that would take us an hour and a half to travel today. So they were quite isolated. Yeah, they were quite isolated from other communities in general, but even the city of Kentville itself being down the mountain. They just figured they'd stay up the mountain. And so this family would survive off of welfare checks and they lived kind of a hunter-gatherer sort of lifestyle. So they caught whatever they could. They harvested whatever berries, fruits that they could. Um, And the welfare checks were not a lot of money to support these families. The, that being said, though, the adult men would sometimes work as farm laborers, um, but at the time, they these laborers would make as low as 50 cents an hour, and that's not a lot of money. And even for the time being, the minimum wage was $4 an hour. Um, it's still oh. relatively low <laughs> compared to that. Yep. And, like kind of going on I guess there was a little not a like a literal drought but there is a drought in work there just wasn't a lot for them to do so they weren't working as farm laborers and there was not a lot of income coming into this family and so this family themselves were like three generations of families basically all of them lived in two they were called tar paper shacks And they lived in the wooded area of the South Mountain, just outside of Wolfville and Kentville. So these homes were falling apart. They had no running water, which meant that none of them had access to showers, baths, or flush toilets. And in the 40s, it was said that their shacks were so crowded that children would often cram together and like they'd all be sleeping on mattresses on the floor because there could be upwards to... Well, I guess fast forward four decades, so in the 80s, um, upwards to 20 people were sharing this decaying three-bedroom home at one time. 
Oh my, oh my goodness. Gosh. Yes, that's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And according to the testimony as well, there was often up to five goalers cramped into a single sized bed trying to keep warm. So wow. imagine your university res beds um, <gasps> and four other people, most often adults or teens, sleeping in that bed. Those with you. beds did not fit one person. Nope. Oh my Let alone goodness. Five. <laughs> Wow. Oh okay. And so in, I guess, another home of theirs, a 65-year-old Stella Goler, she lived with her 80-year-old husband, five sons, and her grandchildren in one of the crumbling shacks. And so this was especially difficult for Stella because her one son, Cecil, he was nonverbal and born paralyzed from the neck down. So oh he goodness. had to be cared for in a house with no running water, no bath, no toilet, and no heat aside from a fire if they had a wood stove or something. I can imagine how hard that was. That would be yeah. so difficult. Yeah. And it was also said that garbage at the time would be thrown into the attic to be disposed of. Um, it kind of reminds me... A- yeah. I don't know if you guys have read The Glass Castle, but... That's just what I was thinking about. Yeah. They had uh, they had cleared out a piece of land, basically, that they were going to build this their dream house, but nothing came of it, and so they just ended up using that as a trash dump. Um, so that's kind of what happened here. And basically what would happen is once the attic would fill completely with garbage, uh, they'd send the kids up to haul it all out, move it, and then they'd repeat the process. They'd just fill up the attic again with garbage. Oh my god. Why goodness. didn't they just throw it out as they made it? Um, <laughs> well, they were in the bottom 1% to 2% of IQ population <laughs> in that area. Oh, so I f- okay. I, I, feel I, like... I take back my question. <laughs> I feel like that had something to do with it, at least. And unfortunately, this type of poverty was not uncommon in the valley. It was estimated that up to a thousand houses, they were shingled or plywood fire traps, as they were described. So there was no comfort, no sanitation, or no hope, as said by one of the managers for a housing repair society in the village, or in the community, I guess. And unfortunately, the adults had little to no schooling. Um, The men of the family often only achieved a third or fourth grade level education. Some had intellectual disabilities, some had physical disabilities, and this all left them quite unequipped to live outside of the mountain. So even if they wanted to, they weren't really prepared to live in a city. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of the family could barely read or write as well, which didn't help their case. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But thankfully, some of the children did attend school um, down the mountain, but they did face extreme discrimination and bullying while they were there. Um, So I'm reading this book right now. It's called On South Mountain, and it's this author and her husband recounting the story that they lived through the Goalers because they grew up kind of with some of the Goaler children and the trial and everything. Um the one author remembers there was what she called a ritualistic stoning happening happening during a school dance. So she came out from the dance and she saw students throwing stones and rocks at a goaler child and they just made a game out of it and that was just something casual that was done. No one did anything to stop it. No one said anything. And everyone just kind of carried on with their day. That's wow. so cruel. Yeah, and with her saying to, like, kind of a ritualistic stoning, like, it happened quite often. And not so much ritualistic in, like, sacrificing them to the devil kind of ritual, but, like, it just was so frequent that it became part of the city, I guess, part of town. My goodness, that's horrifying. Mm-hmm. Right? And um, she also mentioned that being a goaler was a common insult at the time so like if you were to dress poorly if you dressed ridiculously or you said something really stupid to your friends the often response was don't be such a goaler 
Oh my goodness. That's so sad. Yep. And they're just living up on the mountain while these kids are doing their thing down the mountain. My God. It's terrible how, like, because this isn't that long ago. Like, I know it's a couple decades ago now, but it's not that long ago. And there were still so few people that actually cared to want to go and try to help. Like, not even the government wanted to do anything. No, it wasn't until, like, a year after everything happened that the government was like, oh, maybe we should do something. But about the housing crisis, not about the family. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yep, I'll get into that. (laughs) Um. Yeah, so by the 1980s, the people of Kings County, so that was the area of, like, Kenville, Wolfville, South Mountain, that region, they turned a blind eye to the living conditions of the Goalers. So they knew how impoverished they were, and they just didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, and unfortunately, it wasn't the living conditions that the goalers went through and lived through that caught the media's attention. It was what these conditions enabled for the family. So a big reason of what happened was um, they said that the housing and living conditions that these, this family went through is what caused or at least like ignited the claims that came out. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, in 1984, the Goler clan was under investigation for sexual assault, gross indecency, and incest, among other um, charges. That's the word. <laughs> I was like, it's not conviction. It's not. I, that's, that's the word. Um, so, the trials that ensued were labeled the incest hillbilly trials by the people of the Kings County. Classy. Wow, so there's just no, like, there's nope. no... No. <laughs> Oh my god. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, since 1980, four years before the Goalers hit headlines, several of the Goaler children actually tried telling community members and the authorities about the abuse that was happening at their home, but no one believed them and they were often returned to their family where they would face further punishment. What? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hear about that. That's so cruel yeah i learned in the book too um so the author met with one of the girls her name was donna well her real name's not donna but that's what she uses to kind of protect protect who she was um she was taken when she was 11 from the family but they met and um they gained medical records of this goaler child years after it all happened and it turns out that um valley doctors were continuing to send her back to the mountain even after it was noted that she had vaginal warts and tears to her vaginal wall which are both signs of sexual assault oh my goodness and how old was she she was this would have been she was 11 in 1984 so she would have been seven eight. Oh my god oh my god yeah Ew. and they just sent her back up the mountain what That's horrible. And these are medical professionals too. Like she, they, these are doctors. That's disgusting, right? That is disgusting. It's My still God. sexual assault, no matter who the person is. My goodness. Yeah. And so the investigation unfolded in 1984 when a 14-year-old girl of the Goler flam, wow, of the Goler family, she had broken down at school one day. She was in tears, and when the teacher asked her what was going on, she confessed to a long history of abuse that had gone in her family. She also disclosed to her teacher and then later authorities that her father was treating her as a wife. He would <sighs> regularly force sexual relations with her, and this would be 10 to 15 times per month, and that he had told her that he, she was going to have his baby. Oh. At 14 years old. I have nothing to say to that except... Yeah. So (laughs) the RCMP obviously soon became involved in this and started the investigation. And one of the first things that happened was that all of the Golder children were taken from their homes and they were kind of put into a foster care setting and were questioned and all of that. They figured it's not safe to have them at the home during all of this. Yeah, you don't say. That was a good move. Yeah, right? 
Um, and so authorities soon learned that most, if not all, Goler children were being sexually abused at the hands of their family members. So this included their fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts, sisters, brothers, cousins, and even each other at times, apparently. Oh my. Oh my. Because, like, yeah. that seems really weird that, like, the whole family is just... But the thing like... is, too, um, I kind of mentioned it later, they honestly didn't think they were doing anything bad. One of the guys, yeah. one of the Goler family members, when he was interviewed, he was like, I don't know why I'm being arrested. I'm just living life as I would any other day. Like, this is how we live. I don't... Like they. They Get grew up in on. such extreme isolation that this mm-hmm. is the only way they've known since the 1800s. That and it blows my mind. And a lot of the, like, parents and uncles, like, the generation up from the children, they had all, from what I could find, most of them, if not all, had been sexually abused, physically abused, as well as children. So they just kind of grew up thinking this was normal in a household plus all of the stuff that they were going through at school with these kids that is wild yeah and so a sociologist from acadia university um his name is jim sakumin he testified that quote manuscripts dating back to the to 1860 showed inner family relations were prevalent End quote. And he noted that political leaders and officials should have noticed the interbreeding and genetic disorders that were seen on the mountain long before they made the news. Yes, I agree. So it was determined that most recent generations of the family had inherited a hundred years worth of weakened genetics due to the incest. Oh, so that's a lot of yeah, bad genetics. A lot of bad genetics being passed down through generations Yikes. getting worse with each generation <laughs> um so when the adults of the goler family were taken in for interrogation several of them actually openly admitted to authorities some even boasting that they performed sexual acts multiple times with the children this included full sexual intercourse they shared graphic detail about all of it and some even went on to claim that the children initiated it and they wanted it um i find this hard to believe since the claims are of children aged 5 to 14 um i don't think a five-year-old is going to ask their family member to have sex with them i really don't think that's that's gonna happen this is all just so twisted Right? And if it does happen, there's maybe some other issues that we need to be looking at. And so this is where they, like, investigators and sociologists and all of these people believe that because of the living conditions they were in, if you have five people on a single bed, like, stuff may happen, unfortunately, and there's kind of, like, unless you give them proper living spaces and a space for themselves there's a higher risk of all of this happening. Yeah. Um, Due to these confessions, a trial was not anticipated because uh, they all confessed. They all said what had happened. They were just going to get it done and over with. Um, But the accused, all of them, had actually gone and recanted their confessions and denied that they had done anything wrong. They said the children were... I don't know. They said the children were lying and that they were forced and coerced into telling the authorities what they wanted, that they were scared and just said what they needed to hear. And one of the accused even went on to say that other people in town or anywhere else have probably done just as bad, if not worse. Wow. Yeah. So that's good. Good, good. Of course, they were all rounded up and put in jail basically for the night while... They awaited trial, and locals now describe this as a hillbilly sex ring. Ew. Yep. So that's the new label on all of this situation. 
Um, so during this time, although many of the goalers boasted about what went on behind closed doors, many of them were confused as to why they were being arrested, like I said, and they didn't know that they had done anything wrong. And like I said before, they were just living as they always had on the mountain. And in one of the documentaries I watched, I have it um, linked in the source list, one of the, like, the interviewer asks one of the goalers, like, do you know what incest is? And his response was, insects? Like, bugs. He's like, yeah, I know what insects are. And he's like, no, incest. Do you know that it's wrong to sleep with family members? And he's like, oh, oh, no, I didn't know that. Like, they had no idea what the term incest even was. Wow. See, like, knowing all of this, like, I, did they have lawyers? Because I, I don't understand why they would recant all these statements if they genuinely don't think they've done anything wrong, unless a lawyer is telling them to do so. Um, from what I could find, they had one defense attorney in town, I guess, that often would only face, like, 15 cases a year. So they had to hire on a whole bunch of new people. And I think they were able to find one for each of the goalers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I just find it crazy that if if they didn't think what they were doing was wrong, then what is the reason for recanting their statements? I think after they had legal aid, because they they were given legal aid, um, they said shut the hell up basically like don't yeah. say anything take back what you said and then we'll do a proper trial um but 13 people faced 137 charges including sexual assault incest gross indecency buggery which is also known as sodomy and having sex with a girl under 14 years old and children as young as five were being abused 137 charges for 13 people and then two more oops i hit my mic two more women would later be charged so this was a total of 15 defendants i'm gonna do some quick math that's nine charges per person if they were to each have an equal amount of charges that doesn't seem like enough (laughs) no but for 15 defendants that's like Yeah, that's quite a bit. A lot. And so these defendants, um, these included seven family members, so three brothers, their two sisters, and two teenage nephews, and actually also included eight other adults. So these were either like common law or common law relatives. So a lot of the time it was like their common law spouse and then their common law spouse's brother would partake in it. Not to sound rude, but if there were people so into incest and so clearly problematic, why were people willing to join these relationships as common law? And um, So I think the case was they also were on the mountain and... A lot of the times the girls would be married off very young or they would like find a Um. suitor quite young and there was a lot of um, mixing between them so like one individual had married one goaler had two kids but then divorced her and married her sister and continued to have like three kids Oh, so and, just the whole mountain was a problem. Yeah, and then, like, there's t- cases where this guy is married to a goaler, and his brother is married to the goaler's sister kind of thing. So it's just a lot My of goodness. mixing of not good stuff. <laughs> I can't wait to see their family tree. Yeah, I'm going to post a picture of that on our source list because it is quite disgusting. Yeah, I have it on the, our first slide, Rebecca, if you want to look at it right now. Yeah, or just Google, just Google uh, Goaler clan family tree. But um, apparently there were so many people wanting to watch the trial that it was standing room only in the courtroom. And a Crown prosecutor had described like the whole 
thing, the whole trial and case as something out of the movie Deliverance. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, I did a quick look up of it and it's pretty messed up. So <laughs> it makes sense. And so Donna, who I was talking about earlier, she testified against her family um, it, when time came in court in hopes that her voice would help prevent other children from being abused by family members. And so this is kind of hard to hear, so you can kind of skip if you don't want to, but she went on to say, quote, the first time I can remember I was five, just going on six, because I had just graduated from kindergarten going into grade one. I came home and that was the first time I had been raped and it was by my father. If somebody wanted to have sex with one of his kids, he would let them he would let them for a case of beer or a carton of cigarettes or even a pack of cigarettes. They got to pick out whichever child they wanted to have sex with. We had nothing to say. We couldn't prevent it. We couldn't stop them. We were basically lined up against the wall and they chose the one they wanted and we were forced to do it. End quote. Wow. So mm. they were basically prostituting out their kids for beer and cigarettes. That makes my heart so sad. At fucking sorry, at don't mind, sorry, at bomb. At <laughs> it's okay. Five, like I'm just, I can't help but say the f word in that sentence because at five years old, how can you do that to a five year old? Like that makes me just want to cry. Like that's horrible. I got so emotional researching this case and reading the start of that book. It's yeah. a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, my goodness. That's my god. Um. And so during the trial, there was quite a mixed response from the community. Many of them wanted, obviously, to see them in jail and basically to suffer because of what they've done to the kids. But others thought it would kind of be redundant at that point to send them to jail. And what they really needed was, like, welfare to get involved and help them improve their living situation and help them kind of get on their feet because they thought that that was the reason why all of this was happening. Um... It doesn't really excuse for what had happened. It was more so a fix for the future, which I don't really agree with, but I can see where they're coming from. Yeah. So in the midst of the trial, and this was especially, I keep hitting my mic, um, especially during all of their denials, some of the adult goalers had taken a sudden interest into religion. So Willie Goaler who never once let his children go to Sunday school, um, he was now talking like a born-again Christian, saying it was not a con that Jesus was his savior and, you know, like, all of this information. And everyone... It just, like, took everyone kind of by surprise. And for the first time in their entire lives, these goalers were attending evening Bible studies. They were going to Sunday school, like all of this stuff. As soon as these denials hit media, basically. And while this raised some suspicion in a lot of the churchgoers and members of the church, others believed that this was their way of showing remorse. Um, In my opinion, though, I don't think this was the case for the remorse piece. Um, There's video footage of them sitting in court laughing with one another, not knowing anything was going on or what was wrong. Um, And throughout the whole trial, there were apparently no signs of remorse present from all 15 of them. Wow. So No remorse. None. I guess if you don't know that you did something wrong, it would be difficult to show remorse, but I feel like that's still not an excuse. Yeah. And even after, like, obviously they're jailed, but even after Mm -hmm. some of them had been released from prison, they still had no idea. They were like, I honestly don't know what, I keep hitting it, I honestly don't know what I did wrong, which is baffling to me. Yeah. I think that's one of the problems with the justice system is that I think if they so thoroughly don't understand what they did wrong, maybe we should teach them what they did wrong so they don't do it again. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And Like, 
I 100% agree with you. I also always go back to the, ooh, most of them only have a third or fourth grade education level. They know nothing of the justice system, and they probably aren't going to be able to wrap their head around any of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's hard to look at it from a, like an educated point of view where we're at and kind of think like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so moving on, thankfully the Goler children, they all received great psychiatric counseling from the very beginning of the investigation. Five were adopted by families living in the fat, living in the valley. Five were in foster homes. Um, unfortunately the oldest two kind of faced some troubles in their foster teen, sorry, in their foster homes since they were teens at the time, being a little rebellious and... Um, because of all the articles I read, a lot of them were from the time of the trial and the investigation. They thought pretty much that they were just going to slowly end up back on the mountain, um, which sucks. But I wasn't able to find much on where they are now, basically, or like years after the trial, if the other five had been adopted who were in the foster care Um And if the two teens did end up back on the mountain. Well, I know that they did, like, all the children had their identities changed, right? So it would be hard to find information about them today. Yeah, and the authors of the book that I'm I'm reading too, like, they did a whole bunch looking into it. And they even said, like, some of the kids don't even remember all of this happening to them. So it's, like, they're not going to go and pry open this traumatic experience for these children like it's just best to leave them be i think that's fair yeah i think that's a good idea right they were very sensible in that sense yeah um during the trial though the judge had determined that the adult goalers did indeed know right from wrong um since they would post children as lookouts to keep guard when sexually abusing the other children and in some cases The children were often threatened and physically assaulted so they wouldn't tell anyone or they were given gifts to stay silent. So you can't play totally dumb if you're doing that. Clearly you know something is wrong if you have lookouts and you're threatening your kids to stay quiet. Yes. Yeah, I agree. So by the end of the trial, all 15 were arrested. Their charges are as follows. There's going to be a lot of names thrown out. They aren't really important. They're all related and somehow or married in um willie goler he was seven years in jail for gross indecency buggery and incest willie's common law wife four years in jail for sexually assaulting eight children cranswick goler he got six years and nine months in jail for buggery with a 12 year old cousin i think i'm saying it right buggery or budgery i don't know one of the two i'm gonna say buggery um josie goler Cranwick's sister got six months in jail for sexual assault and she appealed this charge. I don't know if she ended up having it appealed or if it was denied. Yeah. Um, Josie's former boyfriend, Earl Johnstone, six months in jail for performing oral sex on a young boy. Uh. Mary Goler, um, Cranswick and Josie's sister got one year in jail for sexual assault and she also appealed this charge. Again, I don't know what came of this charge um mary's husband lawrence johnstone who i believe is earl johnstone's brother who are both dating sister goalers goaler sisters um he got two and a half years for buggery with a niece tom goaler willie's brother got three years in jail for buggery with a nephew and niece Tom's former brother-in-law, Roy Hiltz, he got two and a half years in jail for buggery with a seven-year-old girl. Willie's former brother-in-law, Eugene Brown, he got two and a half years in jail for sexually abusing his niece and nephew. Another former brother-in-law of Willie's, Ralph Kelly, he got three years for buggery with a seven-year-old girl. Ralph Kelly's brother, Lawrence, he got one year for having sex with a 12-year-old girl. Um, St. Clair Joldry, he got one year in jail for having sex with a 12-year-old girl. Charlie Goler Jr., he got two years in jail for having sex with a female cousin under 14. 
And Billy Goler got three years, despite evidence of him being a victim of sexual abuse as a child himself. Um, on this note, though, the trial judge did say that he, of all people, should have known better. Um, but this is although there are claims that all of the Goler adults were sexually abused as children. I'm not sure why they only had evidence against the one. Yeah. Um, but it was estimated that the cost of the trial, legal aid, overtime police work, foster care, and jailing the Goalers would exceed $5 million in 1986. Oh my wow. god. Yep, yeah, so this would be close to $12 million in 2021. Holy smoke, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot crazy. of money. That's crazy. And so, although this trial did shed light on the horrific things that were happening on South Mountain, there were kind of some positive outcomes that came out of it all. So Donna Goler, she became an activist for stricter laws surrounding child abuse and demanding stronger protect protection sorry, of children living from convicted child molesters. So protection from child molesters. Um, right. She fought for stricter regulations in the Canadian Criminal Code, saying it does not protect young relatives of these pedophiles. She outlined an amendment where convicted pedophiles and child molesters must be supervised and can never be in a room with a child alone at any point in time. I didn't find anything in my research if these changes actually happened, like if Donna was actually able to make a change in the criminal code. But, like, I'm sure she must have had some sway since there are now strict regulations regarding these types of offenders. Um, and because of the trials of the Goler family, the government realized, finally and thankfully, that there was a serious housing issue on the South Mountain and surrounding areas, and that something had to be done to help these communities. So funding was provided by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Committee to build multi-family housing and three-roomed houses, which were called hearth homes. I think the idea was great and the execution was okay, but it was still very difficult for many of these families to live in these hearth homes and these multi-family homes because the three-roomed house alone still had a $250 monthly mortgage on it which doesn't seem like a lot, but for people who are making like $130 bi-weekly, if that, um, yeah. it's still a lot. But those who were able to live in the hearth homes were very thankful for the government for this. Yeah. And so when interviewed after the trial and people had been sent to jail, Stella Goler, I guess she was like the head honcho of the house, like she was the, the mom of the kind of thing. Um, she recalls almost freezing, freezing to death with her handicapped son Cecil and 80-year-old husband when the Goler men were arrested. This was because there was no one there to help her grab wood for their fires. She was too weak herself. Obviously, her paralyzed son could not. And her husband was 80, year old, 80 years old, and I don't think he did anything with his life. Um, and so Stella, her husband and Cecil, they actually had a hearth home built for them by the government. And she said that for the very first time in their lives, they had a home that was warm during the winter, which was Aww. crazy for me. I can't me. imagine living that long and never being warm. Yeah. Especially Nova Scotia winters too. Like I sounds horrific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned, although this did not fix all housing issues, it did provide relief for many families. Um, and a lot of these families, too, during interviews uh, said that they had the woods. Like, that's where they used the bathroom in behind their homes. Like, they didn't shower and all of that. So it definitely was a bit of a step up for them. And just quickly, another thing that I wanted to mention, I wasn't really sure where to put it in with the rest of the information, but um, James Boxall, he was a human geography professor. He lived in Kentville, so in the surrounding area where South Mountain is. He lived there in the mid-2000s. And so he would make observations of the rate of individuals with developmental and physical, develop sorry, and physical disabilities in the given area. So that, I guess, was just the research he liked to do what he was interested in. Hmm. But... During Christmas time, um, 
this was an unusually high rate of disabilities were seen. Um, this is when he would notice them. And this was because a lot of the families came into shop for the holidays. Like that would be the only thing that would make sense as to why. And so he actually had asked his friend one day if she had noticed this high rate of um, physical and mental or developmental, excuse me, um, disabilities coming into town. Her response was, quote, oh, yeah, it's when they come down off the mountain for Christmas shopping, end quote. So even in like the mid 2000s, they were still like they still had that. Like, I don't want to say stigma because it obviously was horrific what happened on the mountain, but, like, things changed. It wasn't still happening. It's just the image that they were depicted as. Yeah. Was still coming through into the city. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Sad. But that is, unfortunately, the Goler clan. Um, I didn't realize how not true crime... <laughs> my story was <laughs> i mean i guess it is because they went to trial and all of that but um i do think all three of our cases have a big part in nova scotia history that isn't well known at, at all yeah because how did we even find out about the goler clan because it wasn't until I think Re- last year the year before yeah i think rebecca you mentioned something about just like this is stuff that kind of happens in nova scotia and then yeah, I think I had initially heard of it. Um, Dr. Patrickin uh, was mentioned it in class, and there was an alarming amount of us in class who didn't know what it was. And she said we made her feel old because of it. So I looked them up, and that's how I started to learn about them. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I just, I just think it needs to be taught. Like I know it's a traumatic thing, and these children. Well, they're not children now, but they're still living through it, and it's a traumatic experience for them. But, like, it's kind of a piece of Nova Scotia history. Like, it's... We had a very bad history in Nova Scotia. So, not very bad comparatively, but it was still bad. Yeah. But, yes, that that is unfortunately the Goler clan. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nicole and Journey, for um, sharing those case studies. Uh, like you said, Nicole, they weren't as, like, true crime as we typically cover, because we usually cover, uh, like, serial killers and all of that <laughs> kind of stuff, but it is it is still crime, and it's still very interesting, and Journey, yours was really true crime. <laughs> yeah, that one was. <laughs> yeah. It was a nice there break between There was, like, a bunch of forensics. <laughs> sorry? I was just saying, sorry, it was a nice break between the two of the Our babies. two really traumatic, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. sad. <laughs> yes. There was, yeah. like, a lot of forensics and stuff that was used, but I couldn't really find any information other than, like, there was boot prints. And I was like, yeah. cool. Yeah. He went up to the police officer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've really enjoyed uh, talking about these, um, and I hope everybody else has enjoyed listening to them and has learned a little bit more about uh, some Canadian and specifically uh, Eastern Canadian history. Um And for our next topic, we're going to be jumping over the water to a European married couple, uh, Fred and Mary West. They were a married duo of serial killers. Um, And along with them, we will be covering um, those who kill as a couple or as a group, along with the complexities and details that set them apart from uh, lone serial killers or those who work alone. Um, So I'm excited to work on that next week. And thank you guys again for sharing those um really interesting stories i forgot a joke that's okay i <laughs> see okay. it on our slides and i don't have one <laughs> that's that okay. Is okay maybe instead of the joke we'll take a second to say please decompress after this episode go make a tea go yes. make something <laughs> like this is a very dark episode compared to i mean we d- they're all pretty dark, but like this one especially was quite dark because it involves children. But yes. yeah, so take some time to decompress and yeah. let your brain chill. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And if there's any forensics jokes that you guys want to hear, please send them our way. Yeah, if you have any, <laughs> we're starting to run low. They're harder to find than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so if you want to find us on our socials, we have Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. They are all at what the forensics. Um, our Twitter handle is at WT Forensics PC, or you can find us or contact us on our website at uh, whatthefrensics.ca or our email at whatthefrensics at gmail.com. So we also on our website, just before we go, have uh, stickers and pens. And we are still thinking about doing a little contest giveaway, trying to see if anyone's interested. We have a, a nice uh, tumbler we want to give away, like a wine tumbler and some stickers and some pens. Um, yeah, so let us know if you're interested in that. And this has been another episode of What the Forensics. Uh, we really enjoyed it, and we hope you did too, and we'll see you next time. Just a reminder to everyone that we are not professionals in the forensic science field. We are just students who are learning and want to share what we are learning with our listeners. We're trying to give you the most accurate information, but we are human and we can make mistakes. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope to see you next week. Mm-hmm.